Um, I'll get started. I know we have a few people giving announcements this morning, so I will go ahead and get started as, as folks continue to trickle in. Um, so good morning. Uh, thank you for being here. I hope that you're well and warm this morning. Uh, my name is Emily Ryan. I am the director at the Commons at the University of Kansas, and I have the honor of welcoming you this morning for our keynote lecture by Dr. Kathleen Fitzpatrick. Several years ago, seeing changes to higher education and need for adaptive modes for research and learning, the Commons began exploring the question, what does the future university look like? Through programs and discussions that have spanned domains of knowledge and ways of thinking. Last spring, the KU Libraries and the Commons had planned to host a live event with Dr. Fitzpatrick in Lawrence. Today, this virtual gathering offers us the opportunity to come together comfortably, I hope, to make space for Dr. Fitzpatrick's message, which will also launch the first ever KU Summit on Community Engaged Learning and Scholarship, hosted by the Center for Service Learning. We're so glad that you are here today. Um, and I have a few announcements to make now that I've provided that context, and then I will disappear from your screens. This presentation will be recorded and made available for viewing, thanks to John Rennert and the staff at KU Information Technology. Captioning for this event is provided by iYellow Captions. Our thanks to them for providing this added accessibility for today's events. Um, if you're interested in accessing captions, you can click on the CC button at the bottom of your screen and select show subtitles. And then you can modify the size of the text if you prefer in the drop down settings. Um, to join additional summit sessions, which are open to the public, please visit um, the Center for Service Learning website and we'll drop that in the chat so that you can just directly link to it. At this point, I am pleased to hand over the main screen to Vice Provost for Academic Success, Susan Klusmeyer. Thank you, Emily. Good morning, everyone. Well, I'm excited to have everyone here for our first annual summit on community engaged learning and scholarship which is coordinated by the amazing Center for Service Learning, which is a unit in academic success. So our summit planning efforts today were coordinated in very close partnership uh, with the Center for Service Learning, the KU Libraries, and the Commons. So thank you all um, for your collaborative effort today. I do want to take a moment just to acknowledge our Service Learning Center staff and the associates who served as the summit planning team. So in terms of the Center for Service Learning staff, I just wanna give a quick shout out to our director, Jamela Watson Thompson, Emily Roundtree, the associate director, director, and Kate Kemper, our assistant director. And then I also want to acknowledge our Center for Service Learning Associates, Sarah Teal, who is the head of the Center for Community Affiliate Initiatives and Engagement with the KU Libraries, Emily Ryan, director with the Commons, and Susan Harvey, assistant professor in health, sport, and exercise science. So thank you all for your hard work, and we are very excited to be here today. So the goal for the summit is to engage, connect, and support faculty, staff, and administrators who have an interest in addressing community-identified issues through service learning, community-engaged scholarship, and in civic engagement. The other goal is really to spend some time examining the commitment of the public university to addressing societal issues through campus and community partnerships. I would say that the summit is really truly part of our larger campus commitment to advancing community engaged learning and civic engagement, not only here at KU, but in the community and beyond. And I'm really excited for the opportunity that we have today to bring together faculty and staff to work together with community partners through co-learning and sharing. And I hope this is just the beginning of many conversations, or maybe it's a continuation of some conversations and partnerships. The summit sessions are recorded, as Emily has mentioned, and they'll be available for viewing later on the summit website. I also just want to take a moment to give a kind of a brief overview of the summit sessions following the keynote and I invite you to participate in all that you can today. So there will be four concurrent sessions between 1030 and 1230 featuring our campus faculty, staff and students and community partners. You can visit the summit website for access to the sessions. I invite you to participate in, and drop into the Generous Thinking Lunch Break Zoom, the chat in two from 1230 to one, which is really an open share for colleagues about sessions. 
And then I also encourage you to think about as you're thinking about planning for the spring semester, which is very closely upon us, and you're looking to prepare and maybe engage in some of this work through the semester, is that you can join the post-summit drop-in session for integrating community and civic engagement through teaching and research. As always, the Center for Service Learning is available to work with you, and I know many of you are already working with them, so I continue to encourage you to engage with them as a great campus partner. So now I'd like to go ahead and welcome our provost, Barbara Bickelmeyer, who's going to talk a little bit more about the importance of in community engaged learning and scholarship here at KU. Provost. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for taking part in KU's first summit on community engaged learning and scholarship. Um, and I hope you'll all join me uh, again in sharing appreciation for the Center for Service Learning uh, in our academic success unit, as well as um, with the KU libraries and, and the commons for their um, uh, perfect timing and great work in bringing us uh, Kathleen Fitzpatrick today and for supporting the keynote speaker's appearance. Um, I don't uh, know if everybody's been able to read Kathleen's work, um, but I don't think that there could be a better time for us to be having this conversation today. And I really look forward to, to hearing from Kathleen. Um, and, and one of the reasons why I think it's just such an important message and it's so timely for us is because as we all know, our mission calls us to list students and society by educating leaders and building healthy communities and making discoveries that change the world. And we need to do that um, in order to get to our vision of being an exceptional learning community where we, we lift each other and we advance society. We are all learners uh, in this moment of transformation and we all have something to learn from each other. And, and the idea of generous thinking helps provide a framework for us and a, and a, and a foundation for us in doing that work. As you may know, I sent a message yesterday to the university um, talking about the challenges we face right now and recognizing that our state leaders are um, wondering about the value that we add to the state and they're challenging us um, to, to demonstrate um, our, our value. And I believe truly with all my heart that we are up to the task of doing that. And I don't even have to believe with all my heart, the data and the facts and the work are all around us. And telling our story about that and making those connections is key. And, and as I think about facing the challenges that are in front of us, um, it, it is true that community engaged learning and scholarship is the heart of what we're doing and how we tell the story and how we demonstrate all that we do and not only for our disciplines and not only for our students, but for our state and, and the region beyond. So I hope that this summit will provide you an opportunity um, and all of us together to, to have an opportunity to launch the spring semester by reflecting on how we can think more generously as we deliver public impact, how we can talk about um, how we go about delivering public impact, which includes um, community engaged learning and scholarship. We certainly have challenges ahead of us. I do, again, um, have great confidence that we are up to the task that's in front of us as an institution and as a service partner with our community and our state and the nation and the world. Um, we are committed to supporting excellence. We are certainly committed to serving the academic and programmatic demands of our students and our region, and we're committed to our mission. And community-engaged learning and scholarship um, are important contributors and at the heart of our strategic plan. So thank you all again for taking part in today's program and making time when I know it's the busy beginning of the spring semester. The Center for Service Learning has put together a really strong program um, that I know will help us excel. And I'm um, greatly appreciative of the opportunity that we all have to take a moment to reflect today, to make connections with each other and to turn our thoughts into action um, by collaborating for the public good. Again, it's, it's critical at this moment in history that we're able to not only um, do that work, but to tell the story well. So please help me welcome our visiting scholar uh, and our keynote speaker, uh, Kathleen Fitzpatrick. She's the author of Generous Thinking, a Radical Approach to Saving the University. Uh, her work looks at the university's role in addressing social and political crises in America, and these are particularly timely conversations. 
I believe uh, Kevin Smith might also be uh, joining me in, in doing a welcome here. So Kevin, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Provost Bickelmeyer, and good morning, everyone, and welcome. I am Kevin Smith. I'm the Dean of Libraries at the University of Kansas, and beha on behalf of the KU Libraries and the Commons, we are delighted to have you here this morning for a keynote presentation by Professor Kathleen Fitzpatrick, Director of Digital Humanities and Professor of English at Michigan State University. I want to start with my own sincere thank you to everyone who helped make this event a reality. Uh, it shifted in mid-planning, as so many things did, from uh, in-person to a virtual event, and the team that we had was more than up to the task of handling the logistics. Uh, we're delighted that you all are here and that Dr. Fitzpatrick is here with us. I first met Kathleen in February of 2011 when she came to give a talk at the John Hope Franklin Humanities Center at Duke University. I was at that time the scholarly communications officer for Duke and Kathleen's topic, the future of authorship, writing in a digital age was a strong draw for me. And not only for me, as it turned out, I remember a packed room and I believe I had to sit on the floor. At least this Zoom gathering does allow us more comfortable seating. But more importantly, I remember a talk that was enlightening and inspiring. I came away bubbling with new ideas to consider and projects to try. 2011 was a significant year for Kathleen in several ways beyond, I dare say, her visit to Duke. Her book, Planned Obsolescence, Publishing Technology and the Future of the Academy, came out that year as well. As you can tell from the title, Kathleen has already, was already thinking big about scholarship and higher where scholarship and higher education might be going. It was later that same year that Kathleen became the first ever Director of Scholarly Communications for the Modern Language Association, a pioneering position that gave her a bird's eye view of the academy on the cusp of a digital revolution. Kathleen Fitzpatrick holds a BA and an MFA in English from Louisiana State University and a PhD from New York University. She's the director of MESH, a research and development unit at MSU that is focused on the future of scholarly communication. And she is also project director of the Humanities Commons, an open access, open source network serving more than 17,000 scholars. Now we're here today, of course, to talk about Kathleen's 2019 book, Generous Thinking, A Radical Approach to Saving the University. Once again, she takes on an ambitious topic and brings some powerful ideas to share. As pleased as I am to have this opportunity to listen to and talk with Kathleen about generous thinking, I'm also excited by her new project. As the course of her career indicates, Kathleen does not stand still for very long, nor rest on her laurels, however abundant those laurels may be. She has just posted the final section of a new project on generous leadership for discussion on her website, kfits.info. I recommend a look at that work if you want to participate with Kathleen in the process of her authorship and to continue to learn from her. With all that said, it is a great privilege for me to ask you to join in welcoming Professor Kathleen Fitzpatrick. Thank you so much, Kevin. I really so appreciate that introduction. Um, Provost Bickelmeyer, everyone who has been involved in um, bringing me here today, bringing me to my dining room, I guess, um, but making this, this um, moment possible. I'm really delighted to get to talk with you just a little bit. I am going to go ahead. Oh, um, screen sharing is disabled. Um, so um, can my screen sharing be enabled so that I can add my slides? So you should now be able to see my slides. Um, and I'm again, you know, quite sorry not to be able to be um, 
at Kansas in person today. But I'm really delighted to have this opportunity to share some thoughts with you um, as, as those of you who are engaged in community engaged learning and scholarship think together about um, what is possible ahead of you. Now, a quick note um, before I move on, there is a bit of strong language on my first slide, um, but I think it represents a feeling that a lot of us share right now. A little less than a year ago, um, though it feels like a lifetime, sociologist Tressie McMillan Cottom posted a thread on Twitter thinking through the things that she tells the Black scholars who seek her advice about surviving the academy. And these two tweets in particular caught my attention. Um, this place was fucked up when you got here. It will be fucked up when you leave here. All you can control is how much you let it fuck you up in the process. And then she goes on to say, that's a pretty impolitic stance, but I stand by it. I don't think these institutions can support us or love us. And I honor the many, many people who work to make them more humane, but you alone cannot do that. And you cannot do it ever by killing yourself. Now, this, these tweets stuck with me um, and they prompted me to respond saying, you know, the institution will not love you back, but it's incumbent on those of us who are safe and protected within it to demand that it do better, to try to make it into the kind of place that might someday be capable of love. And this may be utterly quixotic on my part, but it's something that I've been thinking about for a while. What would it take for us to remake the university or to build a new one as an institution that was structurally capable of living up to its duty of care for all of its members, rather than seeking in a moment of crisis to minimize its obligations and make all of its relationships contingent? Now, much of what's ahead derives from the arguments that are in my recent book, Generous Thinking, A Radical Approach to Saving the University. Um, the saving the university part of the book's subtitle has to do with my growing conviction that the survival of institutions of higher education and especially public institutions of higher education is going to require us to change our approach to the work that we do within them and the ways that we use that work to connect the campus to the publics that it serves. Now, the radical approach part grows out of my increasing sense that the necessary change that I'm describing is a huge one, that it can't be made incrementally, but that instead it requires, as Chris Newfield notes in the conclusion of his book, The Great Mistake, a paradigm shift, because there is no easy route, there's no approach, there's no tool that can take us from where we are today to where we need to be. As Cottom has noted in her book, Lower Ed, of the crisis that she's seen growing in the financialization of higher education, this is not a problem for technological innovation or a market product. This requires politics. I mean, the problem, after all, begins with politics. The American public university that not too long ago served as a highly accessible engine of social mobility, making a rich liberal arts-based education broadly available has been utterly undone. We are facing today not just the drastic reduction in that institution's affordability, but an increasing threat to its very public orientation. As rampant privatization not only shifts the burden of paying for higher education from the state to individual students and families, but also turns the work of the institution from the creation of a shared social good, a broadly educated public, to instead focus on the production of market-oriented individual benefit. And all the while, we're also facing what Inside Higher Ed has described as a larger than typical decline in confidence in an American institution in a relatively short time period. And this falling confidence cannot simply be dismissed as evidence of an increasingly entrenched anti-intellectualism in American life, though, of course, without doubt, that exists too. But we need to consider the possibility that, as I argue in the last chapter of Generous Thinking, the paradigm under which higher education has operated in the United States is failing and failing fast. And if our institutions are to survive, we must find a new way of articulating and living out the value of the university in the contemporary world. 
And this is true, not least because this shift in public opinion that Inside Higher Ed is talking about didn't just happen by itself. It was made to happen as part of a program of discrediting and privatizing public services across the nation. However, from time to time, we are confronted with undeniable evidence that many of our institutions, even those institutions that most profess their commitment to public service, have utterly betrayed the trust that the public has placed in them. Which is to say that the decline in confidence in the university is not just caused by the public failing to understand the importance of what we do. It's also that we have in many ways failed. We failed to make that importance clear. We failed to protect our communities, both on campus and off. We failed to build institutions that are genuinely structurally capable of living out the values that they profess. Now, what I'm asking for is a tall order, in many ways swimming against the current of the neoliberal institution. But a large part of what I'm after is to press for new ways of understanding our institutions as communities, as well as in interaction with communities, asking us to take a closer look at the ways that we communicate both with one another and with a range of broader publics about and around our work. And some focused thinking about that public engagement is in order, I would suggest, because our institutions are facing a panoply of crises that we cannot resolve on our own. We need our public's help as much or more than they need ours. Now, these crises don't always give the impression of approaching the kind or the degree of the highly volatile political, economic, and environmental situation that we're currently living through. And yet, the decline in public support for higher education is of a piece with these other crises, part of a series of national and international transformations in assumptions about the responsibility of governments for the public good. I mean, the very notion, in fact, that there can be such a thing as the public good. And the consequences of those transformations are indeed life and death in many cases. So while the concept of generosity may at times seem too touchy-feely to represent the key to the future of the university. I hope that in the book I've put together a case for why this is not so, why, in fact, the particular modes of generous thinking that I'm asking us to undertake within and around our institutions of higher education have the potential to help us navigate the present crises. I mean, many of our fields on campus, after all, are already focused on pressing public issues, and many of us are already working working in publicly engaged ways. Um, but we need to generalize that engagement and to think about the ways that it might, if permitted, transform the institution in the ways that we all think and work within it. And that is to say, the best of what the university has to offer, what matters most, may lie less in its power to advance knowledge in any of its particular fields than in our ability to be a model and a support for generous thinking as a way of being in and with the world. Okay, but first of all, who is this we that I keep talking about? I mean, what is it that we do and why does it matter? Now, much of what I've written focuses on the university's permanent faculty, um, partially because that faculty is my community of practice and partially because of the extent to which the work done by the faculty is seen as being higher education, right? Research and teaching are the primary purposes and visible outputs of our institutions. Moreover, the principles of shared governance under which we operate, at least in theory, suggest that tenured and tenure track faculty members have a significant responsibility for shaping the future of the university. But it's important always to be careful in deploying this we. Um, as Helen Small has pointed out, the first person plural is a rhetorical sleight of hand by which the concerns of the, pro the profession can be made to seem entirely congruent with those of the democratic polity as a whole. And while I hope that my argument has something important to say to folks who work on university campuses but are not faculty or who do not work on university campuses at all, 
that connection can't be assumed. I mean, it would be great if we could make it possible for the we that I'm focusing on here to refer to all of us on campus and off who want to strengthen both our systems of higher education and our ways of engaging with one another in order to help us all build stronger communities to ensure that all of us count. But that is part of the work ahead. So it's important to be careful about how we define us, um, precisely because every us implies a them. And one of the ways that we, and the ways that we define and conceive of that them points to one of the primary problems of the contemporary university, and especially of public universities in the US. I mean, these institutions were founded explicitly in service to the people of their states or regions or communities. And thus those publics should be understood as part of us. And yet the borders of the campus have done more than define a space, right? They determine a sense of belonging as well, transforming everything off campus into them, a sort of generalized other. And granted, sometimes they are imagined to be the audience for our performances, a, a passive group that benefits from and takes in information that we provide. But what might it mean if we understood ourselves and our institutions as embedded in and responsible to the complex collection of communities by which we're surrounded? I mean, how might we together develop a richer sense, not just of them, but of the us that we collectively form. I mean, we talk a lot, after all, about community on campus, both about community engagement and about the institution itself as a community, but we don't always talk about what it is we mean when we invoke the concept. Um, Miranda Joseph explores the ways in which the notion of community gets mythologized, romanticized, and so comes to serve what she sees as a supplementary role with respect to capitalism, right? Filling in its gaps and smoothing over its its flaws in ways that permit capitalism to function without real opposition. Additionally, community in the singular, right, the community, always runs the risk of becoming a disciplinary force, right, a, a declaration of groupness that's designed to produce the us that inevitably suggests a them. If we understand community instead as multiple and diverse, as shifting entities that serve strategic purposes, we might be able to embrace community not as a declaration, but instead as an activity, a practice of solidarity, a process of coalition building. I mean, it's a way of rethinking who counts, of adding others to our numbers and adding ourselves to theirs. And this call for solidarity between the university and the communities outside its walls is a large part of higher education's recent history. Um, it's the subject of the student-led calls for institutional change that spanned the 1960s and 1970s. As Roderick Ferguson has detailed, however, those calls were met with deep resistance, not only within the institution, but in the governmental and corporate environment that oversaw it, leading to political shifts whose apotheosis we've been living out for the last several years. Um, in reaction, our institutions, rather than tearing down their walls, instead turned inward became self-protective, looked away from the possibility of building solidarity with the publics that the university was meant to serve. And so in this sense, community is and has been the university's weakness when it should have been its strength. Right? If we're going to save our institutions, from the relentless economic and political forces that today threaten to undo them, we must begin to understand our campus as a site where new kinds of communities and new kinds of solidarities can and must be built. So the book overall makes the argument that the future of the university requires regrounding the institution in a mode of what I refer to as generous thinking, focusing its research and its pedagogical practices around building community and solidarity, both on campus and across the campus borders. And this requires concerted effort to make clear that the real good of higher education is and must be understood as collective rather than individual. 
So generous thinking asks us to consider how we work with one another on campus and how we connect our campuses to the public around us. It begins by understanding generosity as a mode of engagement that's grounded in listening to one another and to the publics with whom we work, attempting to understand their concerns as deeply as possible before leaping forward to our critiques and solutions. The book goes on to explore ways that the critical reading practices that we enact on campus might be opened up to foster greater engagement between scholars and other readers, creating means for those readers to see more of the ways that scholars work and the reasons for those methods, as well as for scholars to learn more about why general interest readers read the ways they do, building key bridges between two communities that too often seem to speak past one another. I also spend time thinking about the ways and the reasons that scholars might do more of their work in public, publishing in openly accessible venues and in publicly accessible registers, and developing more in community-engaged research in order to bring the university's resources to bear in helping work through community concerns, as well as to transform those communities from passive recipients of the university's knowledge into active collaborators in shared projects. But if we're going to make the kinds of changes that I argue for in the ways that scholars work, both on campus and off, the university as an institution must undergo a fairly radical transformation, becoming the kind of institution that supports rather than dismisses or at times even actively punishes collaboration and community engagement. The university must become the kind of institution that can focus less on individual achievement, on educating for individual leadership, and that instead focuses on building community and indeed on educating for community building. And this requires a fairly radical rethinking of the reward structures of higher education, what we value and how we demonstrate that we value it. I mean, our universities are in many ways structured as collectives in which each member of the institution is charged with some part of the well-being of the whole. I mean, this is how we derive our principles of shared governance, that we each have a contribution to make to the operation of the institution. And yet, when we examine both the kinds of work for which we are actively rewarded, as well as the nature of the rewards themselves, we repeatedly find an emphasis on the individual rather than on the whole. I mean, for instance, for faculty at an institution like mine or like yours, um, the work for which we are most rewarded is our research, um, the work that we pointedly refer to as our own work. Um, and the rewards that we receive often pull us away from the collective, right? So if I publish a well-received book or an article in a prestigious journal, I might be eligible for a course release or for relief from service responsibilities. And all of the other possible rewards that I can seek, promotions, raises, and so on, encourage me to retreat from membership in the university community and instead focus on my own work. And this is part and parcel of the hyper-individualistic orientation of the contemporary university, in which every form of merit, including grades, credits, honors, degrees, rank, status, and more, is determined by what I individually have done, even when I've done it collaboratively. Add to that the situation of most institutions of higher education today, in which austerity-based thinking leads us to understand that merit is always limited, right? And thus your success, your distinction, your accomplishments can only come as my at my expense. And the result is that we find ourselves in a zero-sum game in which we have to compete with one another, right? For attention, for acclaim, for resources, for time. I mean, we're trapped on a quest for what Thorstein Veblen described as invidious distinction, in which we separate ourselves from others by climbing over one another. Now, it's important to note that the situation applies as much to institutions as it does to the individuals who work within them. I mean, insofar as the structures within our institutions privilege achievement through competition, it's because our institutions are similarly under a mandate, as Chris Newfield has said, to compete all the time. 
And it's only when our institutions are able to distance themselves from the rankings and the other qualified metrics for excellence that pit them against one another, that those of us who work for them will likewise be able to move fully away from competitive thinking and into a mode that's more generous. This is no easy task, right? Over the course of the last several years, while generous thinking was in press and after it was published, I had the opportunity to speak on a number of college and university campuses where faculty, staff, students, and administrators were all thinking about how to create and support a better sense of connection between their campus communities and their public facing missions. And the folks who invited me, um, ranging from the, office of, the officers of campus AAUP chapters to presidents and their advisors um, felt a connection with the arguments in generous thinking, not least because they recognized that their institutions require not just better strategic plans, but deep culture change. And that culture change demands, among other things, a serious rethinking of how we work, why we work the way as we do, how we assess and reward that work, and how we recognize that work as work, the things that tend to get dismissed as service, right, but that play a crucial role in building and sustaining collaborative communities. Generous thinking, however, focused pretty tightly on the why and the what of the changes that our university cultures need to make and spent a whole lot less time on how. Um, for instance, right, it's, it's clear that making a better, more sustainable institution requires us to move away from individualistic ideas of meritorious production. In fact, to step off the Fordist production line that forever asks us to do more and instead to think in a humane fashion about the ways that we can do better. Right. Better often, in fact, requires slowing down. It requires talking with our colleagues and our communities, and most importantly, listening to what others have to say. And better requires engagement, connection, and sharing um, in ways that more always encourages us to rush past. Um, turning from more to better can help us access the pleasures, indeed the joys of our work that life on the production line has required us to push aside. But making that change goes against some of the ingrained ways of working that have come to seem natural to us within the university setting. And it's super unclear how we might begin to make such a change. So I was already thinking that I needed to follow up generous thinking with something that would dig a bit further into the how of transformation. And then after one of the talks that I gave, um, an attendee asked me a question that made the stakes of thinking about how painfully clear. Her question's been stuck in my head ever since. Um, Generosity is all well and good, she said, and something that it's relatively easy to embrace when resources are plentiful. But how do we practice generosity in hard times? I mean, can we afford to think generously when we're facing significant budget cuts, for instance? Or is it inevitable that we fall back into analytics-driven competition with every unit, much less every worker, out to protect their own resources and their own privileges? And I don't remember exactly how I answered then. Um, I suspect that it was some combination of saying you're completely right, that's the real question, and pointing out the difficulties involved in, in being, that the difficulties involved in being generous in hard times are precisely why we need to practice generosity in a determined way in good times. And I may have said some things about the importance of transparency and priority setting and decision making and of involving the collective in that process. But I do you know that as I stood there saying whatever it was I was saying, I was thinking, wow, this is hard. I, I don't know. You know, I don't know how we find the wherewithal to remain generous when times are bad, except by having practiced generosity enough to have developed some individual and institutional muscle memory and by recommitting ourselves to our basic values again and again. And I especially don't know how we remain generous at a moment when our institutions are approaching us, we who work for them, as well as we who rely on them, invoking the notion of a shared sacrifice required to keep the institution running. I don't know because I do want the institution to survive and I want to sustain the community that it enables. But I also know that the sacrifices that are called for are never genuinely equitably distributed. 
And I also know that however much I may want to keep the institution running, the institution is not thinking the same thing about me. Our institutions cannot currently love us back, right? However much we sacrifice for them, they will not sacrifice for us. And this returns me to Tressie McMillan Cottom's point. You alone cannot make the institution more humane and especially not by killing yourself in the process. This is especially true for members of minoritized groups working within the academy. It's especially true for faculty without tenure. It's especially true for staff. It's especially true for scholars working in contingent positions. It's especially true for everyone whose who's positions in the hierarchies of prestige and comfort leave them vulnerable especially at moments when we're all in it together, is invoked not in the context of resource sharing, but of sacrifice. Right? Sacrifice tends to roll downhill and to accelerate in the process. And this is how we wind up with furloughs and layoffs among contract faculty and staff at the same time as we find ourselves with a new associate vice president for shared sacrifice. Now, the only way to prevent such sacrifice from rolling downhill is to build structures to channel it otherwise. And this is the deepest goal of generous thinking and by extension of the follow-up project that I'm now working on, which is entitled Leading Generously. In this project, I'm focused on how we can work collectively to build a more generous environment in which we can do our work together. I mean, what kinds of leadership are required for us to remake the university into an institution that is structurally capable of living up to its duty of care for all of its members in good times and bad? Leading generously is in some ways intended to be a practical handbook for putting the ideas of generous thinking into action. But in doing so, it asks its readers to reconsider some basic concepts that underwrite big structural change. It proposes that despite the enormity of the transformation that higher education needs today, um, one large enough to require a revolution, local changes can begin to make a difference and that we are capable of making those local changes. Now, among the concepts that demand reconsideration, however, is the very notion of leadership itself. I mean, we conventionally associate leadership with the folks at the top of an institutional hierarchy, those with the authority to steer the ship. And while I hope that leading generously might speak to them, the project addresses everyone on campus, beginning with the argument that everyone in an institution has the potential to be a leader, to create local transformative change that can model ways of being that others might learn from and join in with. Now, this conviction places a lot of emphasis on individual actors in ways that might seem a bit at odds with some of today's most important ideas about how power operates. Um, those critical ideas, including arguments about race and racism, about sex, gender, and misogyny, about class and power, they understand the issues that they explore to be systemic rather than individual. Um, that is to say, they argue that real change requires social transformation. It requires building institutions, creating governments, enacting laws, transforming economies in ways that work toward equity rather than supporting privilege. And I'm 100% convinced by those arguments. And I have that same end goal, right? Building institutions that are structurally capable of supporting and facilitating the work of creating better communities and a better world. But the institutions we have today aren't going to transform themselves. The key to this problem is where we locate agency, right? Who has the power to start the process of making significant change in the world? If we understand power is residing in the structures and the systems that govern our lives, there's little agency left to the individual. And it's unquestionably true that the structural problems that we face are enormous and that one individual can't do much to change the world. But groups of individuals can. And building those groups starts with individuals who decide to do more, right? To put what individual agency they do have to work in solidarity with others. And so leading generously begins with you, right? Where you are. It starts from the position that each of us is equipped to make change in the aspects of our institutions over which we have influence and that those changes can model new modes of being within our communities. But it recognizes as well that none of us can get far alone, 
To transform a com complex organization, we need to build coalitions and we need to act with the collective firmly in view. Because of this requirement, it's important to recognize that the object of leadership is not institutions, but people, right? Bringing them together and organizing for change. Building a more generous, deeper sense of us asks us to focus our attention on our relationships with our colleagues and our broader communities, ensuring that we maintain the humanity, not just of those we work with and for, but of the structures through which all of us connect. The key to transforming our institutions then is shoring up the means of moving from you to us, right? The means of building the coalitions and the collectives required to transform our institutions and make them capable of the kinds of community oriented thinking we most need today. And along the way, we need to consider what we can gain from becoming better listeners, from learning to sit with difficult conversations and even criticism, from assessing our work and the work of those around us based on our deepest values, from cultivating an atmosphere of mutual and renewable trust, and so on. And so each of the key concepts that I explore in Leading Generously, listening, vulnerability, values, trust, support, and more, is deceptively simple, but with careful consideration can become the foundation for a practice of community building, for thinking through institutional policies and processes and ensuring that they serve the people for whom the institution operates. The necessity of that practice is clear. Right? Our institutions cannot survive the crises that they currently face unless the people and the relationships that make up the institution thrive. Budgets and bottom lines matter, but without its people, the students, the staff, the faculty, the community, the university is nothing. And that's the thing we need to understand now more than ever. And the thing that the amazing program um, that is in front of you today is working toward, right? The recognition that the primary work of the university is connection. And that in hard times, the most generous thing we can do is to connect with ourselves and everyone that we work with so that we all might develop the collective strength necessary to return and rebuild. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kathleen, for that fascinating, thought-provoking, and challenging presentation. Um, I want to let folks know that we have Kathleen on a very tight schedule, and so she is starting her next event in just a few minutes. We're not going to be able to have time today to entertain questions at this session. But I do want to encourage you to attend the roundtables and other events and have a chance to talk to Kathleen about these challenging ideas uh, in more detail. Beyond that, thank you very much, everyone, for attending today. The attendance has been great. And Kathleen, thank you again so much for being here and for sharing your, your work and your thoughts with us. Thank you so much.